All right. Well, here we are, Mark Sisson. Great to be here. Hey, what a, what a great dinner we had last night, huh? It was so good to be again around people. Yeah, you know, that yeah. was and that was uh, you know uh, back with David Nurse uh, who sort of organized the thing. Uh, and, Shout out and, to David Nurse. Yeah, for sure. And uh, you know, we sort of agreed that six is a good number. You know, we've done twenty five of these. Pe- you know, pe- twenty five people at these dinners before. Wow. And it's, it gets out of hand. You can't really, you know, be you know have a have a legit intimate conversation with anybody but the six of us participated in one conversation so i think that's the number it's like a magic number yeah Yeah. the power of six we um it was very funny we at dinner we uh we had a a, it was a quick discussion but i thought it was a funny discussion to have with you about corn right uh because there's a lot of people sort of in in like the keto community and even the the whole foods movement that are like super anti-corn yeah but i've said some things on social media that i guess like have left people scratching their heads like i'm not against a nice corn on the cob right how, like, how do you feel about that? Well, um, agreed. Uh, you know, as as the ancestral health movement um, mo- has sort of evolved, it started in the early days, and you know, hats off to uh, Lauren Cordain uh, and the anti-grain movement. Um, and I think Joe Mercola was one of the early anti-grain guys as well. But, um, you know, this idea that all grains are antithetical to health, all grains are bad for you. Um, and, and so you talk about uh, wheat, and rye and millet and corn and corn is is considered a grain which it is it's a it's a grass seed um however when we talk about the uh the properties of of corn that we're not that wild about the lectins and the phytates and the tightly wound zine the the tightly wound proteins um we're, we're typically speaking about the grain product that's derived from corn that's used to make processed goods that you would find in cookies and crackers and corn and, yeah. uh, and bread and things like that um, but sweet corn is is you know it's a it's more of a vegetable in that vegetable category than it is in that grain category uh, and I've always I'm from Maine and, and really uh, you know a man a main clam bake was lobster clams and corn <laughs> and it wasn't a clam bake uh, or a lobster bake without without corn without the corn yeah yeah, I mean, I'm not, I'm not like. I think a lot of people have seen that documentary, King Corn, and just the overall. The, the, I mean, the the fact that corn today is in everything, yeah. And so, and that's a, that's I think a problem. But like, if you're metabolically healthy and you're metabolically flexible, which is something that I'm going to talk to you about. Um, yeah, I, like I don't see any problem with having like a nice organic corn on the cob in the summer. I mean, it's not, you know, like alongside your ribeye or whatever it is sure. you're eating. You know. So you know, my my take from the beginning ha- has been that all these foods that we talk about exist on a spectrum, yeah. and some are wonderful and fabulous and fantastic for you, and some of them aren't that good. And for some people who have certain sensitivities, whether it's nightshades or whether it's a gluten sensitivity, um, some foods can be you know damaging and 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 life-altering if they go down that path. But in between, there are a lot of places that we can play. Yeah. And I like to look at it, every food sort of, uh, you know, for its own merit. So, you know, we can talk about uh, um, uh, sulforaphanes, right? We can talk about uh, broccoli and cauliflower and Brussels sprouts and all of the purported benefits that they have, and yet some people have issues with these types yeah. of food. Um, so at the end of the day, uh, you know, we are all kind of an experimental one. What I've offered with the Primal Blueprint, and I know you have with Genius Foods, is is a template. And f- from that template, play around and experiment and observe and notice how you feel. And that's really, you know, when, when this is all said and done, this is about enjoying life. Yeah. You know, we are here to enjoy life. And if part of enjoying life is having great food with great company and great conversation, uh, if great food can involve the, the, the widest variety of taste sensations, then that's a good thing. Yeah, I couldn't agree more, and I really appreciate that that uh, message of balance, you know, because I feel like the, the in the nutrition community, what we see is like there's all these factions, right? And they and they tend to f- be very religious about like their nutritional ideology, you know, it's, whether it's vegans or carnivores or people who are like strict paleo. Um, and so, yeah, I, I I really appreciate the 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 more experience I have and the more exposure that I have to uh, the sort of internet nutrition world, the more I appreciate. Um, like messages like yours. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. So, um, metabolic flexibility is a term that, uh, that you hear come up a lot and, um, and you talk a lot about it 
And I think uh, there's a lot of sort of like confusion about what that means, what it implies. What is metabolic flexibility? Well, um, metabolic flexibility is this um, capacity that the human body has to extract energy from, from a variety of different energy substrates. If you are metabolically flexible, you can derive energy from the fat that's stored on your ass or your or your hips or your thighs. Your what are you belly. trying to say, Mark? What are you trying to say? Not you in particular, <laughs> but uh, ones. Yes. Uh, um, metabolic flexibility not only means burning off stored body fat, but but being able to um, combust the food on your plate, the fats on your plate, the carbohydrates on your plate, convert them to glucose, burn those that glucose in the bloodstream. Uh, for fuel, burn the glycogen that the glucose becomes in the muscles or the liver for fuel. Um, it's, it, it involves, uh, in the absence of glucose, the liver's ability to make ketones and use ketones for fuel. So if you're metabolically flexible, you not only derive energy from all these different substrates, um, the best part of it is you just, it, it's fluid. It doesn't, you, you don't have to think about it. You don't have to be conscious about, oh, I ate this and now I can only do these types of activities. The body adapts in a way that uh, is seamless and doesn't care whether you got the fat from your plate of food or from your hips. Doesn't care whether the, the glucose came from um, a slab of bread that you just ate or the glycogen in your muscles. And it doesn't, it doesn't even in, ma in make, many cases, doesn't even know. That glucose is in the bloodstream, it's available, the muscles can use it. So uh, the metabolic flexibility part of this, which seems to be kind of intuitively obvious to a lot of people, the problem is, throughout our lives, while we have this genetic wiring that allows us to achieve metabolic flexibility, uh, our food choices from very early on, for, typically <laughs> dictated by our parents in the first place, have kind of led us down this path of carbohydrate dependency. Mm -hmm. And so when the, when the body is presented with a lot of carbohydrate, the carbohydrate converts to glucose, the body doesn't like to have a lot of glucose in the bloodstream at any one time. There are a couple of mechanisms to get rid of it. One is to convert to glycogen in the muscles. Um, if, the, if the muscles are full of glycogen, um, another strategy is to send it to the, to the fat cells and store that as triglycerides or fat in the fat cells. Um, and ultimately, the body does what it can to try and rid itself of excess glucose. And that's fine. We know how we're, all of us are very good at burning glucose, but glucose doesn't require the metabolic machinery that fats do. So you don't really have to have a lot of mitochondrial activity for muscles to burn glucose. It'll happen in the cytosol or the center of the cell. That's very interesting. You mentioned that the last time that we chatted, and I thought that that was a fascinating insight. That um, so, you, so you basically like strengthen your mitochondria by, by burning so, fat in a way? Right, so, so just to take this one more step down the path of achieving metabolic flexibility, when you don't um, cease to eat meals, in other words, when you eat three square meals a day and you have carbohydrate at every meal and you don't let yourself go three or four hours without eating, um, and typically that's because you are hungry or your blood sugar drops and you feel, you know, low and you need to have something to top off your blood sugar. That's sort of a typical scenario for, for most people of the last several decades who are carb dependent. When you do that, you never tap into your body fat stores. Hmm. And when you never tap into your body fat stores, the body says, look, I, you know, I don't need to build any machinery to burn fat because we're not burning fat. This clown is feeding me carbohydrate all the time, like every two or three hours, all day long. It's a, it's breakfast, the most important meal of the day, uh, followed by a 10.30 coffee break, followed by lunch, followed by an afternoon pick-me-up or else I'll have to take a nap, followed by dinner and then maybe something while you're watching TV before you go to bed. Uh, and, you know, this is, this is a problem with civilization that's made all of this food so available and so handy and so tasty uh, that we tend to kind of rely on that. And... And as such, we never build this metabolic machinery. So the way to do this and the way to develop metabolic flexibility is to cut the carbs, is to reduce the amount of glucose that your body has access to. In so doing, a number of genetic signaling devices take place. And uh, this includes more enzymes to take fat out of storage, mm. uh, uh, what we call mitochondrial biogenesis, the, the building of more mitochondria, which is where the fat actually burns inside the cells. Um, an improvement in mitochondrial efficiency. So even the mitochondria that you do have become more efficient at extracting energy from fat. And through all of this, um, a number of great things happen. First of all, you, you become uh, able to generate energy all day long, whether you eat or not. Mm -hmm. So you, because we all have this ability to store extra calories as fat, this fuel that we carry around with us all the time. Um, and 
and as a result of that access to energy all the time, uh, hunger, appetite, and cravings kind of dissipate, and in, and in many cases, like almost disappear. Uh, you become so efficient at at uh, burning uh, calories, burning energy in the absence of eating uh, that you can do 80, 85, 90 percent of, of, of the work that you would do in the gym just burning fat, just burning stored body fat. So it's an it's a amazing kind of adaptation that all of us have and it's really a result of millions of years of evolution uh, through a period of time when food was really, really scarce. When food is scarce, it's not like, well, you don't eat three meals a day, you only eat one meal a day. No, when food is scarce, it's like you eat one meal and then you might not eat for two or three days. Mm. And our ability to survive that sort of, uh, those harsh conditions relied on us overeating that one meal because we had no means of storing, you know, there's no refrigeration, there was no smoking and uh, other, other means of storing it. So we developed a system where we could overeat and turn the excess calories into energy that we carried around with us conveniently located right above the center of gravity. Hmm. So you don't even have to put your fuel in a five-gallon bucket and lug it around <laughs> or in a backpack. It's like a fanny pack, literally, right over your, you know, your hips. Um, and that's, so that's really one of the most elegant and amazing um, systems in the human body is this ability to, to store fat. To store fat. And we all have that to, to the chagrin of many of us. Uh, and, and really now the challenge is to figure out a way to be able to combust that fat, burn that stored body fat off, use it for fuel, not just to, uh, to have access to energy all day long, but to achieve an ideal body composition, uh, to normalize uh, blood sugar, to normalize uh, blood lipids, reduce risk factors for cancer, heart disease, diabetes, metabolic syndrome, and all the things that we talk about. So in that regard, I would say that, that the pursuit of metabolic flexibility really is the holy grail of health. If you are metabolically flexible, everything else falls into place. Conversely, if you're not metabolically flexible, it becomes more difficult to try and work your way around it by exercising your, your way into that, that system or that situation, um, you know, or taking medications. You know, if, uh, well, like, you, you know, people are taking metformin for their blood sugar management, and sometimes they're taking statins for their lipid management. And these are all really kind of bass ackwards way of, of trying to reduce risk factors when, in fact, just achieving metabolic flexibility will get you there. Did you say bass backwards? Yeah, I did. I like that. It's a word. <laughs> um, no, but it's it it really sets up such an elegant like operating system. Like the best the the people who were the most our ancestors that were most efficient at storing fat that got fat the easiest. Yeah, those are the ones that survived. They survived. They lived long enough to pass the genes along to the next generation. So so it's literally um, you can argue that well you know people will say well you know I'm fat because my parents were fat and, and, and I inherited that that gene. Well, you know, good for you because if you go back far enough, uh, that's the line of survivors and everyone else kind of died out. A thousand percent. Yeah. Yeah. It's just amazing. And and the, the amount of energy that we can store in our fat that for people to not be metabolically flexible, uh, flexible it's like, uh, you know, you're undermining millennia of, of, of adaptation and evolution and natural selection. I mean, I'm just going to do some math out loud. So you can store about 500 grams of carbohydrates in your body. That's it, right? Like yep. about 100, 100 in your liver, 400 in your muscles. So that's like multiplied by four. That's 2,000 calories. Yep. You can store 2,000 calories of sugar yep. you know, in your body. But you store 3,000 calories in just a single pound of fat. Right. Yeah. So um, I'm 10% body fat and I'm 170 pounds. So I have 17 pounds of fat. So let's say some of that fat is necessary for other functions, but beyond uh, fuel and combustion. Um, so if I have 12 pounds of fat on me uh, times, you know, 3,000 uh, calories per pound, uh, that is, what is it, 36,000 calories. Or so that's enough for me to walk 360 miles, 360 miles without eating. Wow. You know, and without suffering the consequences, provided that I'm metabolically flexible. Now, here's where it gets really kind of dicey. If people who are not haven't done the work to become metabolically flexible, they're still at the effect of this carbohydrate dependency. So if I go three days without eating um, because I've done the work and I'm metabolically flexible, as I said, my body really doesn't even know that I'm getting the energy from my body's fat stores, um, and it doesn't care. 
uh, and it doesn't. There's there's no ill effects from it. I still you know because I'm making ketones, uh, my brain is happy uh, because of the ketones. I'm I'm uh, burning uh, fat to do most of the work. Uh, that fat's already on me, and I have a lot of it as we just uh, described. Even even at a low body fat, um, the one of the um, closed loop system concepts that happens as a result of of not eating for days if you're metabolically flexible, is that uh, certain uh, genes are turned on that spare amino acids and spare protein. Mm. So you literally recycle proteins much more efficiently, so you don't even need an external supply of protein during this time. You won't. So if you're metabolically flexible, you won't even lose much in the way of muscle mass if you go days without eating. Now the converse of that is if you're, if you're carb dependent and you skip one meal, you're, you know, you get hangry and you get out of sorts and uh, if you skip like two days of not eating because you haven't done the work and haven't built the metabolic machinery the brain kind of goes ah wait a minute I'm supposed to get glucose all the time and you cut off my glucose what am I going to do I haven't learned how to burn ketones efficiently yet uh, and so the liver is pumping out these ketones and you're spilling them out in your breath and your urine and your and your blood and you dude I'm in ketosis I'm five millimolar I'm six millimolar it doesn't matter if you haven't done the work yet to do that, you're sort of wasting that that precious fuel. Um, so when you um, you know when when you don't eat and you're a carbohydrate dependent person, uh, and the the body still thinks it needs carbs to run on and glucose to run on, then the brain sends a signal to the adrenals. The adrenals secrete cortisol, a mm. stress hormone, and you've heard maybe heard this when people um, you know do inappropriate fasts and they haven't prepared for the fast yet and their cortisol levels go up. Well, cortisol, cortisol basically tears down muscle tissue throughout the body, sends it to the liver so that it become, can be made into glucose to fuel the brain hmm. and to do these activities. So you're literally cannibalizing your own body uh, in a way that um, if you've, again, if you're metabolically flexible, not even an issue. But if you haven't built this metabolic flexibility, that's why you get into problems with um, carb-dependent people doing three-day fasts and four-day hmm. fasts. And it's interesting because it's it's a lot easier, and correct me if I'm wrong, to create uh, glucose from protein than it is from fat because it's not as efficient, right? Because in fat, you can get the glycerol off of the triglyceride. Right. And so in the you know in the model that I talked about where uh, if if I were to go three days without eating uh, or a buddy, uh, Peter Atiyah, would, you know, which he does reg routinely, he does hmm. five-day fasts all the time, you can say this is such an efficient system because the triglyceride, that is the fat molecule that's being combusted, those those uh, three fatty acid molecules, they get, they get combusted. Some get sent to the liver to become ketones, which is a fuel that the brain can use. But the glycerol can be used in, in the uh, manufacture of whatever small amount of glucose is still required. So you can go days without any, any glucose at all, and the body will make glucose from that glycerol and won't need to, to um, you know, cannibalize muscle tissue mm. the way it would in somebody who is not fat adapted and keto adapted. Wow. What do, so there's, I mean, there's the, the whole notion of like fat oxidation yep. versus fat loss, I think sometimes comes up uh, in like the fitness community, you know, the, the sort of evidence-based, using air quotes, fitness community that's very calorie, you know, they tend to be very calorie focused. Um, so what's the, what's, what's the distinction between fat oxidation, which is like burning, the burning of fat and fat loss for people? Is there, is there a difference? No, I mean, you have to, you have to oxidize the fat in order to, to burn it, in order to lose it. Um, you know, we, we talk a lot about endurance athletics and, uh, and the idea that, that the better you are at burning fat, the longer you can go in terms of endurance athletics. Hmm. And so I was a marathon runner in the 70s, and I was a triathlete in the 80s, did Ironman a couple of times. And, and um, you know, the idea there was, as you said, if you only have 2,000 calories worth of glycogen in your muscles, and by the way, that's f 1,600 in your muscles and 100 in your liver. So it's even fewer available to the, the working muscles. Hmm. Because the liver glycogen is pretty much reserved for the brain. Hmm. Um, or more essential uh, essential uh, activities than than uh, than uh, locomotion. So the idea has always been to be as good at burning fat as you possibly could. Um, but the the assumption was 
that it was still going to be about carbohydrate management. So when in the 70s and 80s and even 90s when I was competing and coaching, uh, you know, th those were the years, that the decades of carbo loading. So you always went out and carbo loaded. You overloaded on carbs because the recognition was that you're going to burn through them and you're going to need more of them immediately. Hmm. Um, if you were training, it was carbo loading every single day because you're going to go out and, you know, run 15 miles today and 20 tomorrow and 10 the next day. And, um, and there was never really much attention paid to becoming really, truly fat adapted in keto. In the last decade, um, a number of athletes have, have done really well with this ketogenic training and uh, becoming so uh, good at burning fat that they can run literally six-minute miles, mm. getting 97% of all that caloric requirement from fat and not having to dip into their, uh, into their glycogen stores so much. Wow. Yeah. Is, is, is being in keto, is keto like a, a sort of calorie restriction mimetic? And if so, I guess my question would be like, for an endurance athlete who's chronically in ketosis, uh, wouldn't that be like like a, a like a stress on the body? Yeah, it's definitely a stress. And I think you'll find a lot of um, a stress for an endurance athlete. Um, <clears throat> because an endurance athlete is doing something that is not a particularly... A smart thing to do for humans, and that is to uh, <clears throat> to run at a high, at the highest possible output for the longest possible time. Hmm. You know, historically, uh, humans are designed to conserve energy, and to not want to work that hard, and to not want to run that long. If you go back, you know, ten thousand years, and you suggest, hey, let's go for a let's go for a ten mile run. <laughs> And your buddy says, well, what are we hunting? And you said, no, we're just going to go out for fun and get a workout. Yeah. He would go, you're, you're crazy. You're insane. Is, you know, you're, it's, that's a life-threatening activity. So th the idea of endurance competition and endurance performance now is so antithetical to human health that you kind of, again, have to sort of, you kind of put the component parts together and you say, well, um, if you're going to do this, then here's how you – can do it with the least amount of damage. Um, if you're going to do this, I'm going to train you uh, to be metabolically flexible. So I'm going to use a ketogenic diet for some of that. I'm not going to do it all the time. And so a lot of the guys who are uh, the top keto performers, they don't spend the whole time in ketosis. They, in fact, it's, it's not wise for them to do that. They develop this metabolic flexibility through either ketogenic dieting or time-restricted feeding or a combination of the two, or some amount of fasting, uh, and they literally train the body to build this more of these uh, enzyme systems, more of these mitochondria, and kind of upregulate all of that fat-burning capacity. And then having said that, they don't lose their ability to burn carbs. They don't lose their ability to burn glucose or glycogen. So at any point in time, they can top off their glycogen stores uh, and and that's really what they do when they race. Is there's it's a combination of, um, you know, a, a fat dominant energy systems, but also supplemented with some amount of carbs if that if it if it gets to that. And now you're just tr trying to find where that fine line is, where you don't hit the wall and and have to drop out of the race. Yeah, because you never lose the ability to use glucose. Right. Right. You just enhance your ability to burn fat. Exactly. But that ability to burn glucose when you need it is always going to be there. No, I, it's you know if you say you tell me well you know uh, I went to a birthday party last night and I had you know a piece of cake and I feel like crap. Well, why do you feel like crap? You, you, first of all, if you're metabolically flexible, you don't. It'll just get you know stored as as uh, glycogen, yeah. Um, and if it's an issue for you, go give me fifty air squats, and we'll <laughs> we'll handle that right away. Yeah, you know. Um, but it, I I get a little bit frustrated with the keto community, who spends so much time measuring and just sort of determining how good they are at keto. Uh, that you know, you hear stories of people who say, "Well, uh, you know, I've been keto for two months, but then I." I had a, a day or two where I had 80 grams of carbs and I got kicked out of ketosis. I'm like, okay, what does that look like? Hmm. Well, I felt like crap and I couldn't move for two days. And I'm like, well, that that's you were out of ketosis, but you weren't you're not metabolically flexible yet because you, you, the point here is to always feel good and and to not really think about like what what uh, gustatory mistake you just made. 
and have to rethink it or feel guilty about it because you're metabolically flexible enough to just move on to the next thing and you've got access to these different substrates. So is getting metabolically flexible just a combination of like, you know, fasting and being in ketosis for a certain period of time before which you can then... After which, yeah. A after which, after yeah, which, yeah, sure. I mean, I, it's a tool. I, I think keto is a strategy, a tool, and a toolbox. Uh, the the more time you can be keto, the more refined you can be. The, the you know the 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 better uh, an edge you can put on your metabolic flexibility. Um, some people spend a lot of time in keto. I'm 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 in and out all the time. Some days I'm keto for four days in a row, and uh, other days I might have, you know, 175 or 225, you know, grams of carbs if I look back on the day. Yeah. Um, but for the most part, it's not just the macro element of my diet. It's not just the the, the fat and uh, the, the fats and protein and lack of carbohydrate. It's often my choice of when I eat. Some I go, some days I go uh, dinner to dinner mm -hmm. without eating, and uh, some days when I have lunch, I'm like. Jesus, I really didn't even lunch. I, I didn't need lunch. It's it's more a habit than anything else. I could easily go dinner to dinner to dinner, um, and that's one of the uh, sort of realizations you come to when you become metabolically flexible. Is we eat too damn much food. I mean, all of us do, and even those of us who can get away with it. And that's the other. You know, there are a lot of people who don't uh, ostensibly gain weight and look like they're at the effect of, of their food choices, hmm. but who are probably not as healthy as they could be if they took a real good hard look at what's going on on the inside. Would you say that hunger then is like a sign of, of metabolic in inflexibility? Yeah, I would. Um, to a point, obviously. I mean, you, there's, there's a point at which you can go, only so long, and the body says, "Hey, dude, you got to eat." You know. Yeah. I mean, I mean, it's I like you and I talked about. You know, the cold plunge is yeah. the cold plunge. You can get in that water for ten seconds or fifteen seconds, and it's brisk, and you can get out. Whew, that was that was wonderful. <laughs> uh, but then, as you start to challenge yourself and see how long you can stay in, uh, four minutes and five minutes and seven minutes, at some point, it's no longer a beneficial hormetic experience. Now it's just, now you just have a contest with your, you know, to, yeah. to see, you know, it's a long ball contest basically about, you know, how long, and, and that's one of the reasons I like the cold because it's a, it's a mind game, but you have to be careful about where you set that limit and it's, and it ceases being a good, positive, hormetic, beneficial experience and now becomes something that could actually put you over the edge. Yeah. And that's possible, uh, in, in eating too. I mean, you can, you can go, I have friends who you know, do four and five day fasts a lot. And I'm like, I think that's too much. You know, I don't, I'm not. It, it, that, to me, that, it's, a, it's a little disordered. I got yeah, I, yeah. You know, I'm not an expert in eating disorders. No, 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 but, but I'm, that's what I'm saying. So, you know, a five day fast or six day fast, you know, once a year as a, you know, some sort of homage to your diet and some whatever, that's great. But, but there's a point at which these become, um, as you said, disordered. Uh, so... That's probably, I think, what I try to teach more than anything else with uh, the Primal Blueprint, with Mark's Daily Apple, with the Keto Reset Diet, is this notion of intuitive eating. Like, there's a point beyond which you will not get greater returns. And sometimes there's a point beyond which it'll start to diminish and you'll mm -hmm. lose some of the benefits. So I want you to understand enough about how your body works that you can do some work, you can build some metabolic flexibility, and then just freaking enjoy your life and enjoy every bite of food you ever eat and, and appreciate it for what it is. And, you know, experience the world and don't get so caught up in the hacking and the measuring and the and the challenges of all this. Um, and and can, that's really been my kind of, you know, my, my mantra for the company is live awesome, right? And uh, and that's really what I at the end of the day that's what we all want to want to do. We all want to um, get the greatest amount of pleasure and fulfillment and contentment and enjoyment out of whatever moments we can. Uh, and to the extent that I'm struggling through another four day fast and trying to stay on this track of perfect eating, that doesn't fit. Th that doesn't fit the model of of an awesome life in my book. Yeah, I agree with that. Uh, people always ask me if I've ever done any extended fasts, like like more than 
a 24 hour, maybe a 30. I feel like the most I've ever done is a 36 hour fast, but people, people have asked me if I've ever done any of these like three, four day, five day fasts. And my answer is no. And I'm just like, and they ask me why, and I'm like, well, why, why would I want to do that? I don't, yeah. I don't have any need to, I'm at a body composition that I'm happy with. You know, my labs are always, you know, generally pretty good. So no, I mean, other than a personal challenge to see if you could do it. I yeah. Mean, look, I did, you know, 50 marathons and, and um, I've spent the last two decades trying to convince people not to do marathons because they're bad for you, wow. you know. Um, so there's a point at which I will say, if you want to do a marathon, I'll, I'll coach you how to do yeah. a marathon, you know, and, I'll, and, and we'll get through this. And um, actually, I'll let people do two marathons. I'll let you do one to see if you can finish. And if you liked it and you think you can go faster, I'll let you do one more. And if you do that one more and you're a man and you haven't broken three hours or you're a woman and you haven't done 330, I'm like, find a new sport. This is, <laughs> this is not for you. All this is going to do is just beat you up. And just before we close the loop on the on metabolic flexibility, so would you say it's like about two weeks, two, two to four weeks? Like what is that like induction period like? Like how long does that take? Two to four weeks is a good number. Uh, in, in my book, The Keto Reset Diet, it's basically a six-week program. Um, but it's, you know, it's six weeks kind of like once a year. It's a reset. And... Which isn't to say that you go off the wagon after six weeks. What it means is you've, uh, you know, you're pretty strict about the keto part of it for six weeks. But then, the occasional meal that has some starchy tubers or some, you know, uh, some some rice or something in it isn't going to derail you. It's going to be part of that whole metabolic flexibility thing. And as long as you do that in concert with um, an eating strategy that has you, I do believe that that um, a, a time restricted window for eating is is optimal so yeah. i usually eat 1 30 or 2 o'clock in the afternoon that's my first meal and then i'll eat dinner and last night it was like the blue plate special for a bunch of old people we met at six o'clock at this <laughs> at this restaurant uh but that's great it was uh and i am old so that i can talk about that but no, um, um but basically uh the longer you go in a day without eating the more good stuff happens in your body. Hmm. I, I like that, and I, I would agree with that. I, I had my first meal at noon today. Sometimes I have it at like 11 you know, a.m., uh, but like noon today, and then I try to kind of wrap things up by like 8 or 9 p.m. Yep. Doesn't always happen. Doesn't always happen. But I give myself between tw like minimum 12 hours, but between 12 and 16 hours every day where I'm not eating. I think in our community um, over the past decade, one one sort of common theme is that people have, are just realizing that breakfast is like a a waste of time, b not necessary, yeah. c again too much food. Um, I just think if you wake up starving, there's something you're not metabolically flexible. That's yeah. clear. If you if you wake up starving, then have breakfast. But but if you start to eat the right kind of foods for breakfast, or avoid even more so the wrong kinds of food for breakfast. I mean, you look at the typical American breakfast. It's cornflakes. It's, you know, or oatmeal and orange juice and toast with jam. It's like a sugar fest. What's a Mark Sisson breakfast? Well, like the so meal that you break your fast with. Oh, well, um, I will break a fast with, you know, an omelet at 1 o'clock or one thirty or 2. Um, you know, uh, today, um, I ate at 2 o'clock today, and I had a burger without a bun. And, that, and literally, a burger without a bun, that was it, full stop. It's all I need. So one of the things that you, you also start to realize is not only are three meals – too much, but sometimes two meals, two regular meals of what you used to eat are also too much food. So, so I tend to make my, um, my dinner, my main meal, partly because it's a social thing. I want to, I, there's a point at which I want to sit down with people and eat and discuss and enjoy and have a glass of wine. And so that's kind of my ceremonial, nice meal. And it's no bigger than, it, than it, than it would have been you know, it's no bigger because it's the only meal, if, if it's, that's the case. It's still a piece of steak, some grilled vegetables, um, maybe some cheese mm. and, and a glass of wine. Um, but I've recognized over the past five years that I've cut my total calories back 30%, 35% from what they were five or six years ago. And same, you know, same body fat, same strength levels, uh, same energy levels. So it's a, it's a real eye opener. Um, I I did a thought experiment a bunch of years ago, where um, you know I, we, we tend as humans to see what we can get away with, right? So um, you know your employees at work tend to see how little work they can do and still get paid. <laughs> yeah. um, not all of you, not you guys listening, but um, um, 
And with food, we tend to see how much food we can eat and not get fat or gain weight or feel guilty or feel like, a, you know, or get, whatever, get sick. But it, it really pushes up to the edge for a lot of people. It's, mm. it's like that's kind of the finish your plate thing. Um, you know, God bless Cheesecake Factory for their giant portions, oh, and, man. you know. Um, but what it does is it tends to, to have people uh, be okay with overeating because they just tend to – it's like they see what they can get away with. So I – a bunch of years ago, I thought, you know, it's would be really interesting is to see not what's the most amount I can eat but and not gain weight, but what's the least amount I can eat and maintain muscle mass, still have all the energy I need, never get sick, and most importantly, not be hungry because that hunger just ruins everything. Yeah. And and if you can if you can consciously kind of go back and say, you know, what's the what's the least amount of this meal I can eat and not be hungry later on. Um. You find that it's a it's a demonstrably smaller amount of food than what you used to think you could get away with and not gain weight. Hmm. Wow, so interesting. Yeah, I uh, it, yeah, it, I th- I tend to wake up uh, and I you know like when I when I have my first meal around eleven or noon, um, it always tends to be like yeah very protein rich. Um, I'm not big on like the, I don't like use a lot of added fats or oils. Like I'll use like uh, extra virgin olive oil, which I'm a huge fan of, you know, a tablespoon, two tablespoons max. And then generally I'll snack throughout the day. Well, I don't snack throughout the day, but if I do choose to snack, it'll be, I'll tend to reach for protein, you know, protein rich foods. Yep. Um, and then I have like my big, my big dinner meal, you know? Yep. Um, one thing I've wondered about you, so on the spectrum of like, fully plant-based, fully carnivore. Like, where does Mark Sisson sit on that continuum? So I used to be in the middle, and now I'm more toward carnivore. So I've really been uh, intrigued by the work of uh, Paul Saladino, Sean Baker, a number of these people who are MDs and researchers in this field. Uh, And every time I try to poke a hole in their argument, um, you know, I get a pretty decent response about, uh, you know, we don't... Not only do we not need to eat nearly as much uh, in the way of vegetable matter and and fruit, um, but for some people, uh, that amount of vegetables is, again, antithetical to health, whether it's nightshades, whether it's oxalates, whether it's, uh, uh, you know, what we would assume to be beneficial antioxidants are actually, in fact, plant defenses against us, and they're manifesting themselves in some gut irritation with certain people. Uh, and and the <clears throat> the reason I still continue to eat plants is I want to have the widest variety of food in my diet. I just like broccoli with butter on it. I yeah. just I, I like Brussels sprouts. I like green peas. I mean, I, it's and so I'm not going to not eat them anymore. Um, I I just my fear, not just for me but for people that are following me, is that is that their diet will become too boring. And, I, you know, again, I want life to be exciting. I want every bite of food that I eat to, to taste great. Uh, last night at dinner, I had a, a burrata salad. You know, I had that piece of a burrata, and, and it came with peaches. And that was like a, a, a novel concept for me. So I had a couple of peaches. I mean, that's not, yes, peaches are full of sugar. But, I mean, in the context of that and that New York steak that I had, and you had that two-pound ribeye. Oh, it was so good. <laughs> yeah. So good. Yeah. What was the name of that restaurant again? Draycott. Draycott, shout out to yeah. Draycott in, yeah. in Pacific Palisades, really yeah. good, really good ribeye. Um, that's interesting. Yeah, I, 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 I tend to, I, I like plants, but uh, I also definitely prioritize yeah. like the protein, the meat, uh, the fish, the eggs, things like that. You know, one thing that I see in the in the keto community is. Uh, a tendency to add extra fats. You were talking a little bit earlier about olive mm. oil and the, and the tablespoon here or there, um, and and I and I see this a lot in um, early keto adopters, particularly people who are, you know, tremendously overweight and then d- went to keto because they were sort of given permission to have bacon and butter and fat and lard and cheese. Um, and and one of the dangers, not a danger, but one of the reasons that they maybe plateau at some point is they're still thinking about this being a fat-centric diet, the keto mm. diet being fat-centric. And it's, it's not so much that as it's a, you know, a carb 
deficient diet. It's, right. it's, 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 it's not that you have to add back a ton of fat. It's that you have to really cut the carbs. Uh, and, and another sort of, um, I think, erroneous assumption was that too much protein will you know, convert to glucose and kick you out of ketosis. Well, it takes a fair amount of protein to do that. And if people are having 150 or 160 grams of protein a day, that's not too much, especially if you're a, you know, um, a large person who's got a lot of, of fat to burn. So the notion that you would then want to add in more fat so that the ratios, you know, came back into, into range uh, what it does is you become good at burning fat. You're just not burning off your own body fat. You're not burning off your own fat. Yeah. yeah. I think that's a, that's a crucial distinction that you made, that the ketone fire hose is not a function of added fat in your diet yeah. or, or any fat in your diet. Yeah. It's purely a function of the deficit of exogenous glucose, i.e., you know. Mostly mm -hmm. in form of carbs. Yeah. Yes. But you're right. Exogenous glucose because it's. You know, glucose is what raises insulin, and insulin shuts off ketosis. So that's, you can accomplish this. You, you could be a vegetarian and, and get into ketosis. Um, and you can get into ketosis with, uh, you know, caloric restriction versus um, just macronutrient manipulation. Yeah. But the easiest way is, is to, um, you know, is to have a, a low-carb diet that's adequate in protein and then is not too over over the top in terms of fat yeah i think i think some of the carnivore people uh if i if i may share a theory i think some of these guys were probably you ever you ever meet somebody who kind of has like i'll just use men as an example like like you ever meet a guy who has like kind of a 12 year old boy diet like they like they enjoy pizza yeah. they waffles like a lot of my like uh like my brothers will tell me, so like their coworkers, they see kind of like the kinds of foods that their coworkers eat. You know, they'll eat like hot dogs and pizza and like things like that. Like that, you, yeah. they're just your palate doesn't evolve. Your your theory about or your philosophy about how to eat doesn't evolve, and so vegetables don't really play a role in that. And so then you find a diet like the carnivore diet that like allows you to eat all the meat that you want and see good results from it. Like there's no doubt yeah. that. Um, and so I think the reason why it's so easy for some of these people to cut vegetables out of their diet is because, the, A, they never like vegetables to begin with. And I think that has to do with the fact that many people just don't know how to cook vegetables and make them delicious. So for me, like when I think about, about you know, cutting out like the kinds of vegetables that I know how to make and, 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 and you know, season properly, to me, that just seems like the most boring life because I've had delicious vegetables. But some of these people in the carnivore community, they're like, well, they don't, they don't like vegetables or they don't like fruit or anything like that. And I'm like, what a, what a. No, that's a good theory. I like that. The 12 year old boy diet theory. Did you ever meet anybody like that? Well, well I'm sure a lot of people. Um, no, it's the, it's the, you know, the frat boy diet or whatever. Yeah. Um, yeah, I know. It, I know a lot of adult females that like still love mac and cheese and things like that. You know, pizza, mac and cheese, like all these kinds of foods. Like, yeah. there's nothing bad about those foods, right. but they just like when you build your diet around them, they're yeah. they're limiting in terms. You're right in terms of the palate. Yeah. Uh, no, that's interesting because if you if you kind of parse the the diet in general of a healthy person, if you've gotten rid of sugars, uh, so that's pies, cakes, candies, cookies. Um, if you've gotten rid of grains, it's crackers and, and uh, breads and, um, and cereals. If you've gotten rid of industrial seed oils, so you've gotten rid of so soy, corn, canola, um, cottonseed, whatever else that they might be using, you come down to a pretty short list of food, man. Yeah. You know, you've got, five, you've got beef, pork, lamb. You've got chicken and turkey. Uh, and then you've got some fish. And that's your protein sources. That's really limiting. Um, at least if you're eating vegetables, you've got 17 vegetables that you're going to eat. You know, I know you can name 10, but when you get past 10, it's, you know, you start to have to pull in the rutabagas and the, uh, yeah. you know. Um, so it's, uh, it's, a, it's an interesting um, challenge to be, again, to be an excited eater when you're limited in your, uh, t t the types of foods that you can eat are just meat. Yeah. Right. Or, you know, maybe you're throwing some chicken in there, although most carnivores consider chicken a, a very inferior um, uh, choice. Yeah, they prefer the ruminants. Yeah. Um, and again, we're back to, you know, why are we here? Are we here to see how long we can go just eating meat? Or are we here to, you know, optimize our, our lifespan and or enjoy the most amount of, of, of every moment we can? And in my book, that includes 
you know, pleasurable activities like like eating, and that of necessity requires some variety. And you know, the methods of preparation, the herbs, the spices, the sauces, the dressings, the toppings. I mean, that's why I started Primal Kitchen. I started Primal Kitchen because when I recognized that I got rid of all this other stuff, and there were only going to be five kinds of meat and seventeen vegetables. Like, how am I going to make those palatable? Well, for me, the first thing was I got I got fifteen salad dressings, hmm. so I can show you a bowl of vegetables, raw vegetables, that I will call a salad. And I got 15 different ways to make it flavorful. Uh, So that's, you know, that's the notion of variety there. Yeah. And we've got, you know, red barbecue sauce and the gold barbecue sauce. We've got pasta sauces now, so you can have zucchini pasta. So good. Yeah. Yeah, I like, I live and breathe like your ketchup, your avocado mayo, the ranch is is a staple. What else do I, the lemon turmeric... Yep. Dressing is really good. And, and those are all things that you can put on yeah. otherwise healthy but sort of boring food and make them more exciting. I just think a lot of people don't know how to like, A, they don't know how to cook vegetables. They don't know like that the, the, you know, the low and slow method, you know, really kind of like yeah. breaks, ve- you know, the. Well, that's a 42 second video. Yeah. On how to cook vegetables. Yeah. I mean, but, but it should be done. <laughs> it should be done. People, people are also like very, um, they don't like to use salt because they think that salt's not yeah. good for you. So they don't make them as savory as they yeah. should be. Yeah. Oh, got to have salt in vegetables. Got to have salt. Yeah. Got to have salt. I mean, you got to have salt on an avocado. Yeah. You try eating av- – avocados are amazing. Try yeah. eating an avocado without salt. Yeah. Yeah. No bueno. Um, well, we're almost out of time, dude. This was so fun. Uh, thanks for coming here. You My flew p- all the way from Miami to L.A. just to be on this on this show, right? If that's how you'd like to put it, then absolutely <laughs> I did that. And I'd do it again, Max. <laughs> Man. Um, well, where can listeners find you on social media? And uh, where can they pick up your latest book? Uh, so, uh, Keto for Life, Amazon now because of COVID. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, um, Mark's Daily Apple is the blog, has been for s- since 2006 uh, every day. And uh, I'm on, you know, we have uh, um, uh, Primal Kitchen on Instagram, uh, Primal Kitchen Foods. And uh, I'm Mark Sisson Primal on Instagram. Just a lot of uh, shirtless shots of me. That's also. <laughs> a lot of shirtless shots doing the, what is this, slack line? Slack there? line and, and paddling, yeah. Wow. Yeah. So cool. You you lead a, a rough life, Mark, Marky Mark. Um, the last question that gets asked everybody on the show, what does it mean to you to live a genius life? Um, to live a genius life. Uh, well, for me... It is uh, the um, the currency that I get when somebody that I've never met comes up to me and says, "Dude, I read your book and it changed my life." That's that's uh, that's what we call psychic income in the mm. industry. Yeah. Wow, psychic! I love that. Yeah. Yeah, it's such an amazing feeling. We're so privileged to be able to do what we do. I mean, yeah, and you've been doing it for such a long time. Um, it's just such a gift, you know. Uh, well, thank you for being here. Pleasure. Yeah, dude. Uh, love to be able to call you a friend. Like you're a big inspiration um, to me as well as I'm sure many of my listeners. Uh, to all you guys out there in podcast land, thank you for tuning in. I value your time and attention. Text me to let me know what you thought of this show. 310-299-9401. And I will catch you on the next episode. Peace. Peace.